Hello, everyone. Thank you all for joining. Welcome to Interim Lightning Talks. I'm your host, Parak Katkar. I'm the head of consulting practices at Interim. Interim is a modern product and technology consulting firm, and we have a lot of exciting lightning talks lined up for you uh, that we have specially curated for all of you. Our lightning talks are hosted every Thursday at 5.15 p.m. Eastern time. And each week, one of our practice area consultants they share their knowledge on evolving technology trends in the industry, which will help you keep learning and growing in your career. And this week we were scheduled to have a lightning talk on overview of the best practices on how to decide your application architecture. Um, unfortunately, we have a last minute cancellation. So we're not gonna be able to have this uh, talk this week, but I'm going to take this opportunity to talk about some of the technology trends that we are seeing in the industry. Um, we, have, we have several different uh, disciplines and I'm going to, our, our discipline leads, our practice leads, they constantly keep uh, doing their research of the latest trends and um, some of their work. And I'm going to share it with you. Uh, uh, thoughts, uh, their thoughts, it's actually their thoughts. Uh, I have some of the notes on that. So I'm going to start with, um, our Android trends. Uh, these are prepared by our Android practice. Um, first thing that I want to start with um, is uh, the trend that we are seeing is Jetpack Compose hitting the mainstream. Um, Jetpack Compose, it's a newest uh, UI framework uh, made by Google. It's really gaining a lot of momentum uh, in the industry. Uh, our engineers are already using it uh, at our premier um, large-scale uh, financial clients, and more and more developers want to use that. Um, more and more companies want to do uh, refactors and uh, rewrites. Uh, what that's helping them do is they are um, being prepared to support the newest Android APIs and patterns that will be coming now as well as in upcoming years um, so it's it's a win-win for both developers as well as um, um, the um, large-scale enterprises um, while i mean you don't need to rewrite the existing applications as such but uh, the future is clearly jetpack compose and um, it's um, it's uh, sister architecture clean mevm so we highly recommend you uh, to invest in these new technologies and patterns and that will really position you for a sustainable um, application long term and it will prepare you for future advances. Um, you'll also be able to attract um, uh, the best talents in the industry. Uh, so that's highly recommended. The next trend that we are seeing um, is um, unlike say for example um, ios devices um, which are prepared exclusively by apple android doesn't have a specific manufacturer or model uh, right there are so many different choices across different manufacturers um, so new trends um, like uh, folding phones um, such as uh, Motorola Razor, Samsung Galaxy Z Fold, Z Flip, Microsoft Surface Duo, they are they are presenting very unique challenges to the way Android development has been done. But also there are unique opportunities to explore those new formats. Um, most of the current application they do not adapt well to this new adjusted. Uh, additional screen um, space that uh, we get. Um, so um, the companies who want to uh, are ready to invest uh, into developing into this uh, new form factor, they will gain a huge traction as an early adopter. Um, and our engineers, they are constantly uh, trying to figure out uh, the new ways uh, to adapt to uh, these changes. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll be happy to help uh, any of you guys on that. The next uh, big trend that we are seeing, and we're already doing significant work on it, is KMM, which is Kotlin Multiplatform Mobile. Um, what it does is uh, it empowers 
um, the mobile teams to reuse common code across iOS, Android, as well as web. Right? It's a shared library of code, which covers areas like network layer, database, business logic, data models, and more and more um, um, can be written. Um, writing it once and then um, used by multiple teams and tested by multiple teams. Uh, by by utilizing KMM, we see that enterprises can really accelerate their uh, development cycle. They can uh, utilize the skills of uh, Kotlin Android developers to support the entire product portfolio across numerous languages and platforms. Uh, right? So you can centralize um, the models, logic, layers, and even resources that means a consistent technology experience can be um, experienced by all without the need of re-implementing uh, the same um, logic um, for different um, platforms. That's, that's really going to save a lot of cost uh, and time in future. So we have been doing... Um, a lot of um, assessments as well as um, uh, our development on that platform. So that, that's one of the emerging trends uh, on Android. Apart from that, uh, we see voice commands. Um, that's, that, that's getting more and more uh, used. Their adoption is growing up. Um, Google Assistant APIs are making it easier than uh, wearables. Uh, the uh, Android um, added uh, support, more and more support uh, for that. So that's getting more and more popular. Uh, also, um, many Android code bases are moving towards modelization and Jetpack Compose. It's becoming easier uh, to support the instant apps. Uh, what instant app is, is an instant app uh, allows uh, Android user to seamlessly download and launch a smaller version of uh, the app without needing to go to the play store and download it and it provides a really richer native experience which uh, than what would be possible with a web application on uh, an android device uh, so that's uh, that's really uh, getting more and more popular so that that was about uh, the uh, Android trends. Uh, moving on to the web trends. On web, we are seeing um, multi-language adoption um, as a trend. In 2023, um, we are seeing um, greater adoption of Rust as well as TypeScript uh, is getting more and more adoptions. Uh, in addition to uh, other languages, it's uh, it's allowing more efficient and performant web applications, as um, as these languages are providing uh, the speed. Um, it's Im improving the portability as well. Um, there was a survey that was made in um, 2022 uh, in Stack Overflow Developer Survey. Their Rust was the most loved programming language among the developers, uh, with over 86% of respondents expressing they love using it. And um, TypeScript as well, uh, which is the superset of JavaScript, has been having increasing popularity. Many developers are finding it a valuable tool uh, to build scalable and maintainable web applications. Also, we see that um, Cybersecurity is another major focus uh, in the web application development work. Um, as more and more sensitive information is being shared and stored online, developers need to prioritize security measures. And I was talking about cybersecurity focus. Cybersecurity is a major focus in the web application development world. And as more and more sensitive information is uh, shared and stored online, developers will need to prioritize the security measures in order to protect their users' data. Um, and there was an uh, article published in um, City. Uh, it was noted that 50% of US businesses 
have a cyber security plan in place. And um, in order to remedy this threat, developers will need to implement more and more robust security measures, such as encryptions and two-factor auth uh, authentication in their web applications. Uh, also, AI chatbot adoption is on rise. Um, moving on to the trends on uh, um, Java and cloud native application development, we are seeing mass adoption of uh, Java 11. Um, I think a um, lot of enterprises, they have been uh, on Java 8 uh, and we, we see that in 2023, um, more and more enterprises are uh, finally moving on to Java 11. Um, and looking ahead at uh, developing a long range roadmap to migrate to Java 17. Um, so there is a lot of catching up to do for a lot of enterprises, but um, that's that's pretty much um, ramping up now. And from our experiences where we help our customers to migrate a newer version to Java, it could, it could get difficult because um, there are often a lot of dependencies that needs to be updated, uh, but often a step-by-step -step approach um, is what we recommend. And um, we can, we we have a lot of expertise in supporting our clients in doing these uh, migrations. So we can totally support you uh, and provide you guidance around that. Um, also, uh, something that never gets old is addressing the tech depth um, with the combination of shift to a newer version of uh, Java and then um, the evergreen trend of uh, breaking down monoliths into microservices. Um, it's, it's, it's a perfect time to uh, slow down a little bit and address a lot of tech depth that you have. Um, so that's, that's another um, big uh, ticket item that we see across our customers. Let's move on to iOS. Uh, we see a continued uh, focus on Swift and uh, Swift UI implementation. Um, Swift UI, UI, as a lot of you know, is interactive, reactive, clean, and easy to use. Um, and um, you can you can see a live preview in real time on what we are building, which makes it really really convenient and saves you a lot of time building. Um, Best of all, all the new design patterns moving to a reactive uh, programming. Uh, Swift UI really takes full advantage uh, of the reactiveness. Um, some of the example, it uses bindable object, object binding. Um, it simplifies adding dark mode, avoids crashing when um, uh, updating to IB outlet, merge conflict. There are a lot of advantages. And... Uh, <clears throat> We we have been doing a lot of migrations um, from uh, Objective C uh, to Swift UI, from UI Kit to Objective C to Swift, as well as UI Kit to Swift UI. Um, and uh, yeah, we we have our best practices defined for that uh, in our iOS Center of Excellence, which you can take advantage of, um, as well as um, another uh, really hot uh, trend uh, for past some time is uh, using Swift async await. Our um, iOS practice um, did um, an in-depth uh, Propel workshop as well as lightning talks on that, uh, which is available on our YouTube channel to take advantage of. Um, one of the, um, it, it, it creates an easier and really simplistic way to handle concurrent async calls uh, while it makes it really easier to read uh, through it um, one of the many advantages that it provides is that your code cannot hide any of the completion um, error handlers which could result in no actions taken if there are any errors so it really uh, simplifies the code it also simplifies uh, writing unit tests which is very very powerful it also improves compile time checking um, best of all, async await as well as Swift UI, they really, really work together. 
Uh, so we see a lot of uh, adoption uh, for Swift, Swift UI. Moving on to DevOps trends, um, uh, we see um, with the emergence of platform engineering, we see a lot of service catalog tools like backstage, ops level, <clears throat> they are gaining a lot of popularity. Um, we um, these these tools support plugin development. Uh, they support a lot of new use cases. Uh, um, furthermore, uh, we see continued use of GitOps, uh, which is a trend where Git has been extensively used to orchestrate the handling of infrastructure via CI/CD pipelines. Um, it we predict that this soon will become a norm as organizations get a better handle of maintaining their infrastructure via code. Then um, another one is the DevOps culture. Uh, we'll also see some changes uh, as far as the predictions as we iterate through our learnings on what works best for organization when it comes to innovating and developing faster. Um, Google had a DevOps report for um, last year, uh, which uses Westrom's organizational typology uh, to measure the health of an organization's DevOps culture. And um, it, it showed that um, the generative culture is associated with higher levels of organizational performance compared to uh, organizations characterized by um, bureaucratic culture employees at organizations uh, with generative cultures are more likely to belong to stable teams produce higher quality documentation and uh, spend their time doing meaningful work um, so um another another one uh, is the automation code delivery um there are there are reports um uh, from diner stress um, uh, which states that uh, removing uh, friction uh, between developers that's the main uh, goal uh, for devops which continues to evolve um also ai ops is becoming more and more common as we begin to offload the decision making to machine learning models um this year, um, investment into automating code delivery, deployment, and remediation across DevOps pipeline is set to rise by um, uh, by a, a, like a large, large margin. We are likely to see evolving uh, of uh, tools like GetStream, GPT-3, and other tools are continuing to um, evolve. Um, so um, this is this is this is ensuring the scalability of DevOps across the organizations, and we are also seeing a rise of importance around observability. Um, we've been we've been doing some uh, groundbreaking work in that field as well. Um, so that's that's for DevOps on uh, design side. Uh, we are seeing immersive experiences uh, on the rise. Um, the, um, generative AI is also on the rise. Um, um, some of the Adobe's features such as uh, Photoshop's content aware, fill and face aware, um, they are already using generative AI technologies. And we are seeing um, um, plenty of AI powered websites uh, that help designers generate color palettes for their designs. Uh, more and more technologies will be released in uh, 2023 to help designers with their everyday tasks with AI leading the charge. We are also seeing mass migration. This has been happening for a few years, but we are seeing really mass migration from Adobe XD to Figma. Um, Accessibility is uh, really uh, on the rise. Um, we've been helping a lot of organizations with that. Um, that that pretty much sums up uh, uh, the research that our um, uh, practice leads have been doing across uh, different practice areas. Um, I hope uh, this uh, uh, these trends uh, uh, were helpful for you guys. Um, 
any any questions any thoughts i know this was uh, pretty much last minutes and I, we have some of our practice leads here anybody wants to share um, anything add to anything or any trends that i have uh, missed would love to get uh, some of you guys involved yeah thanks thanks for that Brock. Uh, it's it's definitely interesting to to hear about uh, all the the trends out there across different practices. Um, yeah, definitely, there's been a huge push towards uh, Swift UI and async await within the uh, the iOS, um, and not necessarily just iOS, but across Apple products. And that's what Apple has been trying to do with you know Swift UI. They're also trying to do it cross platform. Where you know you're you're able to build the UI components and you're able to share them across you know the Mac, the iPad, the iPhone, the uh, the Apple Watch, and you know hopefully with the new uh, Vision Pro that's uh, that Apple just announced um, a couple of weeks ago uh, that might be also uh, an integration available there. And you know, as uh, Apple continues on with the augmented reality, it's definitely interesting to keep an eye on the augmented reality world and where that's going to lead us. Nice, thanks for sharing that. And I know now that you and uh, your teams haven't really involved uh, in doing some of these migrations for uh, Enrhythm's um, customers, right? From the legacy uh, technologies to the newer technologies. Um, anything you want to share from your experiences uh, uh, over past, I would say, 12 months uh, doing these migrations, the challenges that uh, the teams are facing around those? Yeah, I mean, you know, one of one of the big things uh, that we encounter um, after a long period of time you know, uh, some applications were built uh, through all design patterns as well as uh, what's now, uh, you know, legacy um, UI components and creating monolithic application. Uh, now, after a certain period of time, those become very uh, hard to work with. Uh, build time starts to increase and become exponential to a point where you're not able to develop as fast or as efficient. Um, you know, it could go up to uh, ranges of like 30 minutes build time and, and above. Um, so the key that we need to do is, you know, stay up with what the industry is trying to do, um, as well as, you know, following some of the, uh, you know, the inner the practices that we're going with. Um, and, you know, we're, we're trying to uh, jump into the latest technologies right when it comes out or when it becomes stable enough, um, you know, just breaking down the monolithic applications to smaller modulars, we're able to reuse them across uh, different platforms, different applications, um, and then, you know, working on things like, uh, you know, like async away is one great example that you gave. Um, you know, it, it covers a lot of the gaps that we used to have in the old, um, you know, some of the combined and uh, different Rx and promises uh, that we used to handle with uh, networking as well as other things. Uh, but what we're trying to do is we're trying to stay up to uh, the latest technologies out there and, um, you know, make sure that we're improving not just uh, the quality and the efficiency of the application, uh, but make sure that we're also tracking things like, you know, error handling and then testing as well as, uh, you know, process and design patterns. So it goes across different uh, components of the application. Cool. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Also on... Um... We have some of our uh, thought leaders on KMM front here. We have um, Greg, who is our um, Android practice lead. We have Amit Goel. Uh, we have Satish Yadav. Um, any of you guys, you want to share <clears throat> anything on uh, KMM front? Or Greg, I see you now. Any any other trends? I know you've done a lot of research and a uh, lot of things that I shared um, 
um, based on your research, uh, would love to hear your talks on uh, your thoughts on Android trends, including KMM. Yeah, <clears throat> so the the trends that you listed off were definitely the uh, the big ones that we had going into 2023. But now that we're halfway through 2023, and IO just happened, uh, one of the yeah. trends that we expected to continue to grow certainly has uh, foldables as new device platform has actually continued to grow. And with Google releasing the official uh, Google Pixel Fold, uh, you know, it's really actually begun to become a new form factor that's making a lot of traction. Uh, until, you know, we see potentially Apple getting on board, it's going to be much more of an Android thing. But the the challenges faced by that new form factor are are unique, but they're growing. And it's really a unique thing to Android to that market share uh, that is you know, an exciting and new opportunity for businesses to stand out when it comes to their Android products, but also in a way to to innovate and engage with what could potentially be, you know, entirely new ways to think about app development or ways to engage in different product uh, markets. So that, that's been something that we're super excited for. And actually next month, we're going to be having a lightning talk about foldable APIs on the Android side. So nice. a little bit of a, a sales pitch for, for next month, we'll be having that. Uh, regarding KMM though, it has continued to mature in a lot of the ways that you spoke about, where its value as a, a middle tier that can help accelerate the app development is certainly true. And where KMM is finding a lot of actual value is to make sure that code is not being duplicated across teams, but still allowing each platform team to do what their platform does best, particularly on iOS, still making sure that it's Swift UI, making sure that it's still in Swift and that all of the native experience and native um, expectations are there from the user and from the developer perspective. KMM does not try to replace the actual UI work and the architecture work of that, but try to replace the, the middle components of network and you know a lot of uh, database libraries and stuff like that, which when separated and tested in isolation can actually give a lot more confidence across bigger uh, organizations for operations of you know common APIs or common um, business processes. So that's been the, the huge value we've found because as we all know, our platform is very sacred to us. We want uh, iOS devs want to work with the iOS technologies, but also iOS users expect their iOS apps to look and feel a certain way. The same thing is completely true of the Android users. Yep. So KMM really is trying to solve one of the longer term issues that multi-platform uh, technology in the past has failed at by trying to be one UI for for multiple people, and it's just never felt great. So KMM is really focusing in on doing the one thing that can be shared uh, uh, appropriately. That being said, though, uh, Amit Goal is one of our uh, leads in the Android practice, and he has actually been working on a KMM project right now for one of our clients. So yep. Amit, I wanted to see if you wanted to add anything to that. Yeah, um, sure. KMM is very exciting. Um, there are good use cases to consolidate the business logic. Um, it works very well when an app has heavy use of business logic, when you can get up to 80% of shared code uh, between Android and iOS. It really increases the velocity, makes things easier to test, as well as like maintenance, anything that needs to be updated. Advantages there, you only need to update once um, and you get the deployments on both platforms. Uh, it's great to have everything in shared code. Uh, so KMM is still emerging. Some items that I am excited about uh, looking forward, uh, the Kotlin, uh, they have a K2 compiler um, that's going to be as part of Kotlin 2.0. Currently, we're at 1.8. 1.9 is around the corner. 2.0 should follow shortly after that. And yeah, there should be significant build time improvements. I think that'll lead to better developer productivity uh, moving forward. And a couple other items that I am excited about, they're not really baked, uh, but something to keep our eyes on. Um, I know Greg did mention that Kotlin multi-platform doesn't try to be an all-in-one solution, including UI, but the JetBrains team is also working on Compose for iOS, uh, and it's very similar to the Compose that you would write for Android. As I mentioned, it's not fully baked yet. Uh, they still have it as alpha, but it's definitely something for us to keep our eyes on moving forward. Um, that could even increase the amount of code that is being shared, uh, which would extend to the UI layers. But the advantage is there as well. Um, you're not, as a 
proposal to clients, we wouldn't be boxing them into a specific technology where they would have to lock themselves in to using this. They can pick and choose exactly what they want to share. So those are some of the advantages on that front. Nice. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that, Amit, as well as Greg. Any, any, any other uh, trends any of you guys want to share? Question, uh, Parag. A uh, quick question. You mentioned about cybersecurity. Um, is this something in Rhythm currently doing or plan to do in the future? I mean, like offer cybersecurity service to clients? We would love to do it in future, but no, currently we not, right? Currently our specializations uh, from the technology perspective uh, are focused on mobile, um, iOS, Android app development. We focus on uh, uh, web uh, engineering, web development, um, user interfaces, as well as uh, cloud, uh, cloud native app development, um, including DevOps. We have heavy focus on uh, QA automation. Uh, and these are the areas that uh, we have done a lot of work on and we continuously keep uh, tab on the evolving trends, but uh, we are aware that um, cybersecurity is definitely um, something very important. But yeah, we would love to have uh, some of uh, the users listening. Uh, if you are passionate about cybersecurity, we would love uh, you guys to join us and uh, start a cybersecurity practice with us because our customers, they, they want uh, definitely a lot of help uh, on that. Thanks for that question, Nikolai. Anyone else? All our engineering practices are doing exciting, groundbreaking work for our clients. And as you guys know, uh, the technology is evolving. Uh, our engineers, our practice lead, they have been uh, putting a lot of efforts in learning these technologies. We have some of um, the engineers here, Alan Ryan, Rihanna, they have been doing um, assessment uh, in Rhythm's Pulse. It's an uh, offering where we go in and we do in-depth um, code analysis assessment of uh, your architecture. We provide uh, recommendations uh, on how to improve several aspects um, uh, based on your pain points, on your need. Uh, so um, whether it's assessments, whether it's building products from the ground up or it's uh, modernization, we uh, are here uh, to help you guys. And uh, the um, engineers who are listening to it, uh, we have a vibrant practice area uh, driven culture here. So we would love uh, for you guys to come join us um well, that that that's it for this week reminder to you guys we do these lightning talks every thursday at 5 15 p.m eastern time and uh, next week atmar gispert who is a senior ios engineer with us is going to give um, us an overview of swift localization and automatic grammar agreement and i'm looking forward to this talk uh, please make sure you mark your calendar for next week. Thank you all for joining. Uh, have a wonderful evening and I'll see you guys next week.